All right, so real life talk. January 1897, Stephen Crane, the author, actually is on this boat, the Commodore that actually does sink. He actually is one of four people that try to survive. And, and a lot of the story, let's just say it's it's very auto-fictional, but uh, it's dressed up, if you will. So it still is a, a fictional story at its heart. But this actually happened to him. He was on a little dinghy mm -hmm. clinging for life in the middle of the ocean, which sounds terrifying. So we've got four main characters, right? The correspondent. We've got the oiler. We got the chef, the cook, and we got the captain, right? Oh, you, got the cor you, got, you got the correspondent, and uh, which which one is it? Is it the oiler? They're they're the ones that are rowing, right? And then the cook's the one that's bailing water out, and then the captain's injured, but he he still is organizing men. Like he's not portrayed as useless because they really are all in this together in this razor sharp survival story. I, I always think about, yes, you need a leader, you need somebody to keep everybody motivated, you need to keep everybody focused, but if you're in our little dinghy, and I know that sometimes throughout the story as they're, you know, trying to make their way to land and they're trying to survive, and the captain is giving advice stuff, how much of it played a positive role in the success of these men surviving or not surviving? I I have to tend to you know, my my the negative crypto is going to come out here. You really and are. I feel yeah. like he was more of a detriment. Yeah, yeah. That that sounds like you. That is how you would read the stories. <laughs> if they tossed the captain over, I feel like everybody would have survived. <laughs> um, you know they'd have to get up for that. And considering that the captain didn't even want to swat the freaking seagull off of his head, I'm gonna guess getting up to try to toss another man out of this boat, injured or not, probably out of the question. <laughs> Yeah, probably. That was the most hilarious part of the story. Can you imagine just blah, 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 sitting on top of your head and a little bit of burp poop comes down? Oh, my God. He's just like mortified and doesn't even move or do anything. Mm -hmm. I, I just, that would be a comedy part of this bit. <laughs> yeah. And does this story not remind you a little bit of to build a fire the way that it's it's really hard to articulate cause to me? It's not man versus nature. It's man's role in position to nature. Right. This is part of the naturalism movement. This is, you know, coming after romanticism where nature is like glorified. It's it's poetic. It's beautiful. It's this great source of of inspiration. And then naturalism kind of comes along and it's a lot more pessimistic. And it's like, wow, uh, nature is super dangerous and doesn't care who you are. It will spit you up and chew you out if you are not careful. So so here we are with these people who are in this boat that is being bucked like a Bronco with stabby, knifey water waves coming at them, the freezing cold where they're putting their feet together. Like, this is a perilous life and situation to be in. Crane does a great job of making the world come alive, and he takes this that, na it, yeah, as you said, not so much that nature versus man, but how nature can isolate man, that mm. they're out on the ocean all alone, and that he attributes that these items of water, which is technically not alive, has this a live element to it because it could spell death for these men. Do you think isolation was a theme that was played with by crane throughout this? Oh, definitely. I think that as he experienced it probably himself and you're thinking you're all alone. And I don't know if you've ever been out on the ocean before. And I, I have when I lived in the keys and uh, when I did some deep sea fishing off of uh, San Francisco, it's terrifying when you're out there and it's just three or four people and you look around and you can't see land anymore, which is a very odd feeling and you're moving and you just get this sense of being small, especially surrounded by all of that, mm. what perceives to be empty blue water. And then at nighttime, I've never been out on the ocean at night, but ooh, I can only imagine as it gets pitch black and all you see is stars and the noises come out. Ooh, I uh, give me the mountains any day. <laughs> yeah, the the insignificance of your life suddenly becomes really apparent when you're in like a sensory deprivation chamber, like the ocean. Um, you know, let's say it this way: the author definitely plays it up, in my opinion, because you know when their feet come together for warmth, they start talking about the camaraderie and how there's purpose in their life when they're together. And to me, I thought there was a little bit of play with this where nature is indiscriminate, it's chaotic, it's dangerous, and mankind almost in an absurdist way is always trying to assign value, trying to assign meaning, trying to assign 
purpose and design behind nature, even though it's not there for a lot of people, right? And here you see how these men, they almost get a little bit more happy having a purpose, right? Like, remember the cook's like, that's a life-saving station. There's life-saving people. We're going there. And, and the correspondent's a little pessimistic at first, but then the men kind of keep repeating themselves and they're like, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to get saved. This is, this is totally going to happen. I think what we see is men are trying to assign purpose and value in life in, in a very perilous and chaotic world. I want to add on to that as well. I think that put in, in these peril situations of how nature can really bring out and make you question your own mortality. And that's what Crane has done masterfully here in this story is these men have to rely on each other. Otherwise, there is no surviving. And I think as the narrator, uh, the correspondent, uh, monologues through part of this story when he's sitting there at night by himself and the sharks start coming out and he realizes if I don't change my ways and, and start being a little bit more positive, if I continue down this pessimistic road and and drag these men down with me, we're not going to survive. And I think there's kind of a uh, an epiphany that takes place a lot of times in our lives when we, we come to face with our mortality inside of nature because it's so much more grander than us. Right. One of the, the biggest things with Stephen Crane I've noticed in this piece is that there are they're, – they're playing with – purpose and religion too sometimes like 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 should we just go to hell and, and this man that's waving the black like on, on the shores what, what is his purpose what is his meaning like and they they mentioned several times like why in the seven gods of the seas could what i have come this far just to die like there should be a greater purpose for me what did you take in this conversation with how i don't know i keep saying the word absurdist right which i I don't know when that word came about. Um, I, I mean, Camus was much later than when this story came out, so I think it came out after. But it's that idea of, you know, you have religion having this greater purpose and design to life versus maybe a little bit more of cynicism in, in naturalistic type writing where we're challenging that and we're saying, no, there is no design and purpose in life. And you can see that man is creating that. There's there's clearly like an element of that discussion happening in the story. I also think that if we look at the story and correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't he start to prey upon a star, wish upon a star first? An inanimate object has become his hold on his sanity. And then afterwards, it almost becomes godlike, or that's when he starts to turn, I think, to a god or religion to to save him because maybe he's kind of given up on himself. Well, um, here's another way to look at it. When he's saved, you're correct. There is a man that like appeared to have a halo. They described him kind of like a saint. They're using those those words, right? But the, he finds salvation in humanity, right? The same way that these four men started to feel better around each other. They had purpose. They had a reason. Iron sharp, sharpens iron in some regards. But it's it's the fact that when he was around humanity as opposed to the cold, inhuman elements of nature – that he started to have these values and these these warm feelings of salvation in a sense. And he realizes that maybe he should have been a better person. I think he has that uh, epiphany that a lot of people do when faced with death of, hmm, did I make the right choices? And that happens probably for a lot of people. Man, I'll tell you what, if I saw a shark in that water, you, you could, even if the boat capsized, I ain't swimming to shore. I am getting on top of that boat like that captain and holding on for dear life. Um, you know, we kind of skipped over that part, how they're, they're, you know, I think you mentioned that there were sharks earlier, but, but the boat capsized and they, they have to swim to shore. Two of them had been working so hard the whole time that, that they kind of run out of energy. And it, it was our boy, Billy, right? He, he doesn't make it like the, the only Euler. one, he's the only one that had a name, right? What, what's the purpose of all of them being kind of like identified as a job, a vocation? Again, there's that idea of you know, vocations are something we create. We create purpose to create value in, in, in the economy as humans. What's the point of them being identified by their vocation? And then the one person that was like identified by a name was the one that didn't make it. Like there's there's a lot to discuss here, I feel like. I was so angry. <laughs> Billy, the one guy that should have made it, does it. And I think that is a, a life lesson of, yeah, of course, you could maybe go down. And I kind of thought about this for a brief moment of that the the weak will bring the strong down. Uh, but it, it really comes to that point of Billy, 
who should have survived, the oiler, that was the most uh, physically fit. He gave all he had for his fellow friends inside of the boat, and he couldn't swim the rest of the way. And the captain who was injured made it. The cook, uh, who we're kind of led to believe is overweight, makes it. And the reporter, who is, you know, not a, a seaman, uh, you know, that does, doesn't, you know, fit the mold of the other three, he makes it as well. Uh, and that sometimes life throws you a curveball, and it doesn't matter if you're the best prepared, you're still not going to be able to do it. That sometimes it comes down to luck. Maybe it's fate, mm. maybe it's not. I don't know. Mm, the randomness versus design. That's a really good yep. point. Yeah, um, exactly. There, there's one point where they talk about, hey, we had eight cigars. Uh, half of them got wet. We've only got four cigars. Oh, do we have any lights? Oh, we've only got three matches. And that kind of lines up with the story too, right? We had a boat full of people. Oh, they didn't all make it. Only these four cigars ended up dry. These four men ended up on the small boat. And only three were dry with with the the matches, right? The three the three matches basically, and one of them didn't pass it. There might have been a little bit of foreshadowing there in my view. Oh yeah. And I think that uh Billy being the match that, <laughs> that didn't make it. Uh, I think go show that sometimes uh, some people look at life of that your hard work doesn't pay off and that you'll work yourself literally to death. And that's what Billy did. I mean, talk about killing your darlings, right? Poor, <laughs> poor Billy, the only one that kind of was like a likable person, I feel like on some level. I mean, I guess likable might be too strong of a wording there, but he's clearly the one that feels like from a design perspective was going to make it and the randomness and the uncaring elements of savagery of, of, of nature took its course. And I think that's a, that's, I think it's good to have both the romantic elements to how we view nature, uh, nature, as well as the cynical, like naturalism elements. So I know he, he kind of plays with both. Like I wouldn't say he's all naturalistic, but, but I definitely think it's, it's good to have like this in our canon to talk about these elements and to talk about things realistically, as opposed to just idealistically. And I just have to wonder, did Stephen Crane ever get back in a boat? Or he's like, nope, I'm waiting for the airplane to be invented. <laughs> Staying Gosh. on this island forever. <laughs> <laughs> I never would, that's for sure. Let us know yeah. what your favorite part of this story is. We'll leave a playlist down below for our other talks from Stephen Crane. Definitely got to do some more of these. This was a good story. So appreciate you spending some time with us. Uh, leave an icon of a boat if you enjoyed today's conversation. It'll help us out and let YouTube know that you enjoyed it. My name's Ben Una. Peace. Peace.